I'm uh, the owner of Art Gallery Life and Keen, uh, based in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very honored to have three artists, uh, amazing artists here with me today, uh, Mary D. Vincent Vincentus, Mary Tully Parker, and Jackie Schatz, uh, who will actually travel all the way from New York to be in Boston to be with us. Uh, we had a wonderful reception yesterday. Thank you very much to everybody who came uh, to see the show and also to meet them. Uh, I think we all had a great, great time. Now to about 2 o'clock, we're going to have an artist talk. So the artists will take turns to uh, talk about themselves and then we'll also be focusing on a, a few uh, of their works in the show. Uh, the show is uh, called Harbinger and it will be on view uh, through October 17. So um, I'm going to pass a microphone to each artist and they will take turns uh, of to talk about 15, 20 minutes, and then at the end of it, we might have a little Q&A if anyone's interested to uh, have a little conversation with uh, the artists. Uh, it's gonna be a fun, intimate uh, occasion, and this event is actually uh, streamed live on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, later on, we're going to put the video, uh, edited video, onto YouTube as well. Um, so without wasting too much time, I would like to welcome Mary De Vincentis. Hi, everybody. Um, okay. Happy to be here today. Um, and I want to thank, first of all, uh, Lysan and Mark and Abby for putting on this wonderful event, and Jackie Schatz for um, turning Lysan onto my work. So, and Mary, who I love, who love your work as well, and it's great to meet you today and yesterday. So, um, what I want to say first is that what is most important to me as an artist I've discovered over time, is becoming part of a conversation, an ever-widening conversation. Um, and I think this exhibit is a really great example. And when I say conversation, I mean with, with other artists, with curators, with people who are interested in, in art history, and with every other person who comes across the work, who have an interest in the work. So this show particularly, I think, is a, a beautiful example of how a conversation can be enhanced and expanded because I believe that that was Lysan's idea for the show was to have kind of a conversation between three artists who have something in common and something different and unique and subjective about their work to share. And the way the show has been hung, I think, reflects that in a really beautiful way. And the other thing Lysan suggested was that each of us write our statement about one of the other artists. And I thought that was a brilliant idea. And Jackie Schatz wrote an incredible statement about my work. In fact, probably the best, most accurate and most resonant statement I have read about it. So if you get a chance, check that out. It's on the website. <laughs> so I think, I think being part of a conversation uh, for me involves some responsibility on my part. Certainly to make the work, which of course I love doing, but also the way I conduct my life and what's important to me. And for me, that is to cultivate awareness and consciousness and presence. And I think by doing so, I'm more open to absorbing and understanding my own internal experiences and everything out in the world that affects me and touches me and uh, touches other people. And so I think it gives the work a foundation um, that I consider essential to it. There's a couple of ways that I practice, a couple of practices that I do to um, enhance my own growth in this way, my own uh, cultivation of awareness. One is a daily meditation practice. Number two is doing embodiment kinds of practices as well. So that could be yoga, or that could be um, meditative practices that focus on being aware of your internal body state and inhabiting your body. And the third thing that I do, which is a little out of the box, is I do um, on a weekly basis, sometimes more, sometimes less, I do an imaginative journey to what I call my board of directors. And these are artists, living, non-living, contemporary, historical, who um, basically show up. They, I have kind of an imaginative space. It's kind of a, 
kind of a castle room with a big round table, and I kind of go there in my mind, and people show up. <laughs> and in a way, that's my way of feeling less alone in the studio and feeling a deeper, deeper connection to other, other artists. And I believe when you're in that kind of state, that you're outside of time, so you have access to the entire collective unconscious. And I'm going to give you just two brief examples so you get an idea of what that might look like for me. Uh, one is one day I showed up and Eva Hesse was there. Now, I don't resonate with her work particularly, but she was there. <laughs> and she said to me, she said, I want you to read the letter that Saul LeWitt sent me. And that's a famous letter that I didn't really remember at the time um, about per persevering as an artist when you're discouraged and taking risks as an artist. It's a beautiful letter, so if you get to see it, it's great. So that's one example. She also told me, told me to look at her paintings, which I don't really think about, but she has a series of paintings of kind of figurative portrait kind of monster faces, which I could resonate with more closely with my own work. And the other journey that's memorable is a recent one where I ran across um, an artist I admire named Enrique Martinez Celea. He's a Latino ex-artist. He does representative work that's very um, powerful, based on nature, animals, and people. You could see why I might be interested in that work. And without making a long, making a long story short, we um, had a short conversation about a white lion. So, okay, it helped me, you know, because in one of my paintings it was a helpful kind of conversation what that might represent. And then three days later on Instagram, he, paint, he posted a painting with a white lion in it. No lie. And I think it was a new painting. So, you know, I'm not doing anything anybody else can't do. It's nothing special, but I'm just saying there is a way to, you know, kind of really feel like you're part of that stream of consciousness, et cetera. Okay, on to process. For me, um, these are my two paintings. There's some behind you there, one here, um, a few uh, small ones up around. Um, each painting has its own character for me. So um, ideas come to me mostly through the written word or the, spoke, or the spoken word. So it might be coming a phrase from a song, a poem, a movie, um, not, much, not often movies because that's visual, but sometimes the dialogue, um, novels, a turn of phrase. So let's see if there's one here that I can think of that. So the painting behind you, which is between the light and me, uh, that's a line from an Emily Dickinson poem. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about that painting. And so what I'm looking for is an emblematic moment in a narrative, something that is a very powerful image that could represent a multidimensional level of thoughts and emotions. So you'll see that my work is relatively simple in terms of imagery. I'm looking for something that will be memorable and something that will have multiple meanings. And I'm happy if people don't know the backstory. I love telling the story behind the paintings because I'm a story lover. But if people don't know that story, I'm equally delighted because I w I'm thrilled when they come to me and say, oh, is this what you were thinking of? And I'm like, no. <laughs> but I love that idea. <laughs> and it brings a whole other dimension back to me so that the, you know, the, the viewer becomes a part of that whole experience of consciousness and awareness. And so I usually start with a, just a really small sketch, black and white, in a tiny sketchbook so I don't overthink it. Then I make a background, and then I put on whatever imagery I'm thinking about, which, of course, changes along the way. So maybe I'll talk about a few paintings. How much time do I have left, do we know? About five minutes? Okay. So I'll pick maybe this painting over here to talk about. Is that convenient for you guys to do? Okay, because that'll take about four or five minutes. So this painting, um, was going to be part of a show that I was going to have right at the beginning of the pandemic that was canceled. And the show was called Between the Light and Me because it was about predicaments and dilemmas and the messiness of life. And this poem is about, I mean, this painting is about that poem. It's from a poem by Emily Dickinson called um, 
I, I, it was, I heard a fly buzz, then I died. And it was the story, she told the story from her point of view of the dying person, of having all her relatives around and the light shining in and her wanting to go toward that light. And at the very last minute, a stumbling, buzzing fly flew right in her line of vision as she died. <laughs> and I thought that was so perfect. So then my challenge is like, how do I make that image in, into something external? And so this is what came up with this very, I, I think it's a metaphor, metaphorically done because the fly is extremely detailed and very vivid and real. And she herself is kind of fading out into um, a greater consciousness. Um, and you'll see that each painting has different ways of working with the surface. And I think of my space, the space that I use as a space that kind of is neither Eastern in terms of flatness um, or Western in terms of perspective, but some kind of dream state in between those two. Okay, I think that's it. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Well, that was great, Mary. No, I'm totally intimidated. Um, so um, <laughs> I want to thank Liz Hahn for this visionary show and for putting us together. And I, part of being an artist, and I want to thank Mark and Abby. I want to uh, say that part of being an artist is not just about my work, but it's about everyone else's work. And Mary mentioned the magic room. Well, for me, the magic room right now, besides the Metropolitan Museum, <laughs> where I grew up, is Instagram, because I get to see so many artists' work and connect to them. And it has a personal feeling, even though it's um, a technical device, which I've never been comfortable with technical devices. So I, several, many years ago, I saw a concert by a Zimbabwean musician um, who played the Mabira and sang, his name was Forward Quenda and his parents named him, even though it was forward, it was forward, forward. And when he, before he started singing, he said, the songs are always there. And just when I start to sing, this channel opens up and they come down. And I guess that's how I, since I've been remembering that all these years, in a way I think about my work that way. And I'm not gonna say that it comes from nowhere because I think it comes from everywhere that I've been interested in for my whole life, which is I wanted to be an archeologist, I wrote poetry, I studied dance, and I read, I'm a reading addict. <laughs> so um, all of that is there, but I don't think about it consciously when I work. I don't think consciously. But what I do is I look at other people's paintings because I started out as a painter and even though I'm a sculptor, I'm really more interested in painting. <laughs> and <laughs> when I went to grad school, everybody did abstract uh, color theory work. So it wasn't until uh, many years later talking to a friend and I said, you know, Lee, I really liked these figures in the paintings. She's like, Jackie, it's 20 years later. You can do that if you want to do figures, <laughs> do figures. <laughs> so I um, started doing figures and I make a sketch from a figure that attracts me in a painting and it could be an old painting, it could be a contemporary painting, anybody's painting. It's not sculpture, because if it's sculpture, I just feel like I'm copying a shape, redoing it. 
I make a sketch and I, well, I used to work from the painting itself and when I first started doing figures, you would actually recognize the painting. It was like a, a sculptural representation of Homer's painting on the beach, Eagle Head or something. But gradually it became more abstract and so I do it from, I work from my drawing because it abstracts it more. So I start with a figure, but it can totally change. It usually to does totally change. And because I work in clay, you make something and then you fire it and then you look at it and it's not working because it needs color or it needs something else. So I either hack a piece of it off with a hammer <laughs> and put it on something else so I have a whole like floor of discarded parts, like some kind of archaeological ruin. And I never know when I'm going to need them, but they're there. So in a way, it's like found object sculpture. And then I also can make things to add to them, like things, loops out of wire that extend it, or um, things out of plaster bandages, so that I can work on it after it's uh, made. And then maybe something starts to be clear to me, like what I'm doing. But it's never really clear to me when I'm working, and I only make decisions formally, like how does it look? And it's more like what I don't want it to be, <laughs> you know? So um, I guess in a way it's a negative process. Now sometimes I also get jealous of people's paintings because you have a lot of elements in them. And so the question is how to have a bunch of elements in a sculpture that are attached. So I like things to be attached. So that's part of the process is finding out how to have two figures or another element, not on all of them, attached, but it's not attached in a painting, which already gives you a space. Um, ever since I was a child, I liked to make dolls. And I went through the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I made every doll that, not, actually it was the World Book, every doll that they had in this little section out of different materials. But then I kind of forgot about it. Okay, another element is somebody came to my studio recently and afterwards I was saying that I like to dance and she said, well, there's a lot of movement in your sculpture. And I actually never even thought of that beforehand, but it was good to hear about that because it helps me make choices afterwards and also think about that, that that is an important thing to me and I don't like symmetrical, static. That's not an interesting thing for me sculpturally. Um, so, I have gotten things from Mary's paintings. Many things, and very literally the piece on the back wall, um, which is one of the pieces that you, if you saw her painting, you would recognize this as being from her painting. It's recognizable. And um, it was, it's a little delicate because of this kind of floating feeling sculpturally. So that's when I work. Oh, so you met, clay is soft. You, and it doesn't really hold its shape until you until it hardens up. But for, so there's a lot of propping up <laughs> when I'm working, like supporting things until they're in the right thing. And I don't really, I can't work on the wall because they would fall apart. So I have to kind of imagine that and then how to attach them to the wall and at what angle. That's a whole other thing. Not the part I like, but it have to do it. Um, these, uh, pieces, and I have a third one that I did, are based on a Susan Rothenberg painting, and I think that's also 
probably fairly recognizable. Um, and their little legs are, I think on this one, on one of them they're made out of wire and covered with plaster bandages. And the other, I'm not even sure anymore which one is wire and which is just um, ceramic. So artists that I admire, and I admire a lot of artists, um, and so, so this was a piece, this is kind of a shape of a body that you could see in Mary's work, that kind of falling figure, and she's used that more than once that pinkish figure. So I did this part of the figure and it had some head on, a head on it, like a traditional head. And heads are a problem for me because they're so literal. Um, so I hacked off the head and this was lying around for a really long time, <laughs> like over a year. And then I um, added this with plaster bandages and this, and this is paper clay now. So I think, uh, for a long time, I wanted to be Philip Guston. <laughs> and I wanted to do sculptures like Philip Guston. But then I realized that I wasn't Philip Guston. <laughs> but that one of the things I really liked about Philip Guston was his original heads, which are more than heads. So I had to find my own head that's not so stereotyped or sentimental. So that's working against these negative ideas, something that's too specific, that something that's sentimental, too dramatic. So I, this is a, a shape that I use a lot. So it's, you don't have the face, so you're looking at it from the back. And I invented this little hair shape, you know. Um, so, and I, I have a number of sculptures that use that. Um, and I'll just do one, this, when I was a child, I liked to make um, flowers out of tissue paper, out of tissues, and my mother's lipstick. And I would kind of scrunch them together with a bobby pin, and then I would c color them with my mother's lipstick. So I, this image of flowers like that, and this part, this also I made from a shadow on the floor and it was lying around. It never seemed complete. And I had made this flower that was also lying around that I tried on several different sculptures. But this is made out of cotton balls. So to me, it's important. Clay isn't important to me as a material. It's important to me to just be able to do what I want with whatever materials at hand. And um, so, I made this out of cotton balls, but it's covered in gel medium and it's painted. Um, and sometimes I don't realize what a sculpture is until the end. So I made this and it does have a, I, what interested me about this, it interests me how figures change their shape in space without actually being anatomically correct or something from a figure class, but it in interests me to have, okay, this will be the last thing. Indian sculpture interests me because it has volume and also flatness, and Egyptian sculpture has that too, so that's important to me formally in my work. So this kind of um, flatness and curving thing or volume, um, this is a more volumetric, um, and then this was a shape that I had used in other sculptures, kind of like a spiral or a snake or something. And somehow it came together. It, it just fit in there. And when I looked at it, it was like this interaction and the title came later, which was, I love you, do you love me? <laughs> <laughs> so, Hello, um, if uh, 
people are watching from the Netherland region. Hello. <laughs> um, of course, thank you to Lausanne. Um, it's an honor for me to be showing with these two. Um, and uh, I guess uh, the first thing I'll talk about is what is it? Um, a lot of people don't know what uh, the medium that I use is. Um, it's rug hooking, which is a, um, a traditional American um, folk art that grew up along the coasts of North America uh, in the middle 19th century when um, the burlap feed sacks became um, prevalent in the mid, you know, like 1850s. Uh, and when they were emptied, the women would just take like a, um, a piece of dried something from the fireplace, a burnt little charred thing, and draw a picture of like their rooster. So it was not um, artistic, you know, training, or it was very much a, a folk art, um, you know, and just made rugs for the home or uh, the actual, you know, the bed rugs, the, you know, s that you've heard of bed rugs, um, like snug as a bug in a rug, that comes from that. Those, those are the English version of the same actual technique. Um, so they were really warm and, um, you know, they're, they're, it's a really heavy, uh, it's made from wool, mostly from wool. And so it makes a really nice, warm, heavy covering or protecting your, you know, your floor, your hearth from a spark, whatever. But, um, you know, a lot of people think that it's weaving or embroidery or, you know, knitted or, or something. But um, because, because um, like most people that do hook, there, there are a lot of rug hookers. Um, but most of them do it like for themselves. So they're, they're making a, a rug for their floor or a gift for their family and stuff. So there aren't a lot of people that um, have really gone crazy with it. Like, <laughs> I, I just, like the first year that I learned to hook, I made 11 rugs and that was 20 years ago. And so, you know, I, I have a lot of work, um, but I generally work in, in series and I'll talk about that in a minute. But in terms of what it is, it's a, um, a woven background. I usually use linen. Uh, sort of like burlap, you know, that kind of a, of a foundation. And then uh, really literally a hook. Um, it's, it's almost like, well, the first one was a, a nail that was bent and just put into a piece of wood. So it's very primitive. So this hook just pulls the loops up through the background. Um, these are loops that are made of strips of wool that are cut with a little machine, um, a hand crank machine like a pasta cutter. So everything that I do is um, by hand. Uh, I don't use anything electronic. There's a lot, of, um, a lot of rug making happening now that's very popular with tufting guns or electric uh, punch needle kind of guns, um, which you can cover a huge surface in a long time. Um, you're more restricted in terms of what like colors and, and density, but um, no. <laughs> no, when our power goes out, I can still hook, so that's a benefit. Um, but anyway, so uh, these, uh, what, the work that is in this gallery is really from three different uh, series that, I, that I've done. Um, this, this, this one and this one are from a, um, New York City in the dirty old New York City days. <laughs> Um, I lived in the city for 20 years from like 75 to 95. So, and I lived in the East Village when it was the heroin capital of the world, <laughs> which I don't know why my parents let me live there, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so, so this is a series that I, some of the things that I remember, like the Pyramid Club is on 7th and A. It's still there, but um, you know, a lot of memories there. This is, I lived a, a block away from the Hells Angels Motorcycle New York City headquarters, which was on 3rd and A. Um, and, you know, I, I was like this little dancer girl walking down the street past them with their, they were out lifting weights and they had, you know, like 15 motorcycles 
lined up, and, and they were, they just completely ignored anyone. They weren't, you know, they would never talk to you or anything. They were very, very good guys, they seemed. Um, but, you know, it was like a 3 a.m. in the morning, all starting off their motorcycles. So it was interesting to live that close. And there's one more um, over here of, this is De Roberti's pastry shop that just closed recently, that was open in 1904, um, again on First Avenue. It was sort of like an institution in the East Village, Vinieros versus De Roberti's. And um, I worked there for a few years. Um, I made cappuccino for Philip Glass. <laughs> It was like in, in those days, you know, a lot of those people lived sort of in that neighborhood. So it was really an interesting place to work. But so it just, it just, they just sold it because they couldn't um, keep it in the family any longer, which is a shame. But anyway, so it's sort of nostalgic for me. Um, and then there's, I guess it's not really a series, but I do uh, make a lot of rugs about um, things I remember from my childhood visiting Wisconsin. My parents were, were both from Wisconsin, so we went there. That was like camp. Like we went there every summer and, and just, you know, petted bunnies and rode horses and, and stuff. So there's a lot of my work is from my memories of Wisconsin. Um, this one is um, Went Cafe, which is, you know, sort of like the general store. Just, a, it's a pretty common uh, rural image of all the guys with their farmer caps sitting, having their coffee. And this one is um, from the Piggly Wiggly. It's called um, Marcel, Cynthia, and Ruth at the Piggly Wiggly, which, uh, like, when we went there, I just couldn't believe they had a grocery store named <laughs> Piggly Wiggly, so it stuck in my head. So this is my my mom, my aunt, and my grandmother, theoretically, you know, um, wearing their rollers like in the 60s when that was what was done. Um, and the third one is um, the, this over here, so I'm going to make everybody turn their cameras. <laughs> come on, come on, Dad. Um, the, these, I've done a lot of uh, of rugs of this series, um, which is a tribute to the quilters of G's Bend, Alabama. Um, if you don't, if you haven't heard of them, because you've been living under a rock for the past 20 years, <laughs> um, they, they, um, it's a very isolated community in Alabama. Um, the quilters have their own quilting tradition, um, and the quilts are just incredible stunning, different, so, um, I don't know, like just artistic in a really different way. Folk arty, folk art-ish, but, but more than that. Um, anyway, I saw them when they were at the Whitney Museum, which was like 2002, I think, and I just was blown away um, by their work and by themselves. There was a video uh, that showed them um, singing hymns together and, you know, a whole group of women of a certain age um, around a table just together, their families, their kids, you know. Um, it was just very moving. So I um, started hooking uh, portraits of them. And uh, uh, first I did the smaller ones, this size, uh, and they're, they're in front of one of their quilts. So. Um, they're standing in my head in front of their quilt. Um, so I did the small ones and then I did the larger ones. Um, these, these I also felt that I wanted to um, honor them like Gustav Klimt honored his aristocratic women in his paintings. Uh, actually, Gustav Klimt and some of these early quilters were working at the same time. Um, and I found a lot of the graphic elements and the colors uh, shared between Klimt and, and these women. Not that that matters, but it was really interesting. And I just sort of put them together. So these, some of these are called um, 
like this is, you know, has the in, in quilt, uh, I mean, in climped, and Nettie Young in climped, um, and that's, you know, like this is a climped dish. She had an actual quilt laying here in the photo, and this is a, a more climped dish version of that. So, um, Nettie Young um, was my first one. Many, she has passed on, many of these have, have passed on. Um, and there's, there's a lot of, uh, currently, a lot of G's Bend quilts that are newer being shown. Um, although there is a great exhibit in New York right now at Nicole, Nicoline Beauchamp, I think, is the name of the gallery, of um, one of the main quilters, Mary Lee Bendolph, which is really um, special. And the, you know, 10 of the quilts are now at the Met, the, the Met bought. 10 of the G's Van quilts, and they're in their collection. We went to see them last year. And uh, if you get a chance, definitely, it's worth seeing the real thing. So is, it, is that enough for me? <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, will all will all three of the artists be uh, able to come up here and and we'll try to ask you questions? <laughs> yeah. So anybody, you know, want to ask any anything? You know, like uh, um, what's your favorite color? <laughs> what 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 is art? <laughs> What is life? How has COVID affected you all? You know, yeah. I mean, what is art? Art is the accumulation of all of human wisdom and interest in the world, as well as the evolution of the natural world. Art is everything. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't follow you. <laughs> you can say the same, amen. Actually, I, I'm really not that crazy about art, honestly. <laughs> like, I, I like certain art and certain artists, but um, I, don't, I don't have an art background. Um, I trained as a dancer and then worked in publishing. But um, so it's been very interesting. You know, I've only actually been selling my work for 10 years. So it's been really interesting to really learn more about art and the art world, which is really bizarre. I mean, I, I just can't, I can't get over the things that we continue to come across that really surprise me about the art world. It's very different than the dance world. It's very different than the real world. Uh, you know, so it's, it's just been, um, that's been the interesting part of it for me. But. I'll just add one thing, I guess. I think um, art is the opportunity for an individual to, again, absorb their culture, their own experience in the world, um, and reflect it back so that other people can see it from a new and different way and perhaps take something from it that's fresh and new. And in that way, we kind of all contribute to a a really huge conversation that's going on since the beginning of time. Wow. Yay! <laughs> Anybody have any question? Leslie, perhaps? Um, um, like female? I don't have a question. I, I just enjoy hearing how personal you know, your work is, all of you, in different ways. And I wanted to say to you that the MFA is having a quilt show next month. It's so oh, yeah. and and it's yeah, and some of the G's been quilts are going to be in it. And, and isn't that the one with Michael? Michael is going to be. He has a book in there too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Michael, Michael C. Thorpe. Yes. Is going to have yes another amazing quilter. Yes. Um, but Jackie and this Mary, <laughs> um, I. I really related to the emotional and psychological and sort of amorphous way you come to your work. And um, I appreciate it very much. And it seemed deep, very deep to me. 
very female to me. Um, and I'm so glad I got to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, is there a question from a man? <laughs> uh oh. Oh, wonderful, John. John is going to ask a question. Okay. Um, I th you all seem to be very involved in figures and in color and distorting both uh, and in your own unique ways. And maybe you can put something together about those two things. Finding your own way to do a figure is what Mary's talking about in we each ha I mean, a anybody can do art, and if you find your own way to do it, and sometimes that takes time, you find your own way to do figures so that um, it's like you create this new <laughs> creature in the world. And the color, well, I like color. Um, <laughs> but uh, also, uh, for me, uh, formally, color creates structure, so they're not separate. Um, and it, it's going back and forth between the color and the shape that makes something work. And it seems like we are all very, yes, involved in that. And I have a question for. Mary Tooley, because I'm just like amazed at the subtlety of the colors and shapes. Um, and, you know, obviously they're very expressive, that you, vi how you visualize that. I mean, do you draw on the piece of. Uh, I draw like the outline. Um, of the of the figures, and then I fill it in, um, and it never really looks like it, like with the quilters, for example, they don't really look like that because I'm, it's not like I'm able to draw their faces in a you know like a, a really serious art portrait. So um, I try to put more of their character in um, in in the people. Uh, so that even if they turn out not looking like they really look, they look like somebody. Right. Um, you know, like they have like a, uh, you know, like they have an expression on their face, and they're do they're really doing something. So, um, but it's a, you know, um, because it's been a long time that I've been working with wool and the colors and the different fabrics and um, different sizes of strips and everything that. Um, you know, I've gotten to um, be able to produce more subtle um, things like, like that. Or, you know, it's like with anything, the more you practice, the right. more you are able to ma manipulate the materials to get what you want to get. So. Right. I thought of something else with the figures is, I think I have this idea of figures changing into other things, like that's an old mythical thing, half animal, half human. And I feel like your work also is yeah. uh, creat creatures that aren't specifically one thing. So in a way, they're in the process of metamorphizing. Mm -hmm. And that also conveys some kind of movement through time. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. Um, you know, sometimes like the painting behind you the, with the red rider in it, that, that was not going to be a part creature in the beginning, and she just emerged from, from that background, unbidden, mm -hmm. and I went with it. And I think for me, I, you know, I went to art school, I was always a representational painter, um, so I, you know, did figure drawings and, you know, in vivo uh, landscapes, but a lot of figures. And the further I got away from art school, um, the more free I felt to make a figure in any way that I chose. And the other thing that helped me loosen up was that for a long time, um, my work got very tight at the end of art school. It was, it was almost too tight. And I was trying to express ideas that I didn't really have the language for yet. 
So I took a break from color work and I took a break from painting and I made monotypes, which are a process where you paint on glass or plastic, put a piece of paper on the top, rub the paper and the image transfers. And when you do that, you, all the tightness is gone and something new emerges, there's always a surprise. So I became used to really working that way and that ultimately informed the way that I was able to paint. So that was my freedom from <laughs> my art education, basically, which I think we all need to find. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. You, when you make your human figures, they seem very abstracted. But when you paint, uh, paint animals, like your cat, mm -hmm. the, rat, the bunny, and the fly, yes, there's a lot of does. details. Why is that? Well, yeah, that is true. The exception is the horse. <laughs> but yes, I think, I think I feel more freedom with the animals because there's not this, you know, as much of a art historical reference to figures. You know, they, animals can be as whatever they want to be pretty much, but figures have this whole way of, of coming from history in terms of how they were handled and how beautifully they were painted and, and animals never quite came up to that. Um, and I really think in my painting that I want every element of the painting to be equally important. Uh -huh. So from the, the blue tree to the pine needles to the cat, to the yellow starred background, I want them each to kind of be alive and breathing and conscious. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody? Leslie. Yes. Jackie, you mentioned your childhood a couple times. Did you get support for doing artwork when you were a child? I my mother, uh, for a while we lived in Queens, and every Sunday my mother took me to the Natural History Museum to see films and to see the museum, and then later I lived near the Metropolitan Museum, and I went to art classes there and at MoMA, so I got a lot of ex support for art. However, my mother always thought, I mean, I don't think she thought of it as a career, or as my grandfather would say, can you make a living? <laughs> and so she thought I should learn to type. Mm -hmm. So I could do that, and I took typing three times and failed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. So anyway, um, I, d I did get support, though. Um, yeah. You have a question for each other? I have a question. Um, now, you you have very different sizes of work in this so what's that where does that come that from that is it about? yeah what's that about um, well part of it is well I, I've always worked on the smaller side so working lar larger was a wonderful um, risk-taking adventure for me so that was part of why I started working larger to see what that would feel like and what would come from that. Um, but generally now, I would say that when I'm thinking of an idea, I, I just have a sense of whether it is going to work out best mm -hmm. on a smaller side, more intimate, there's a subject matter is more intimate that I want to convey or more expansive and kind of mm -hmm. entering into the space. Um, so it really just depends on the idea that I have. Mm -hmm. So that, again, each painting is very individualized. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so, and conclude here, right? And thank you very much to all of you. I've enjoyed this talk. I've learned so much about you. And all of you are so amazing. I really have so much respect for all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I just want to remind everybody this exhibition Harbinger is going to be uh, on view in the gallery uh, until October 17, but it's going to be online for a bit. Yeah, so please enjoy the work uh, and also, you know, just uh, email us, you know, call us, uh, you know, DM us with any questions. And, and with that, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And, and goodbye. <laughs>